Get ready for the Product Divas Lair, your fun-sized dose of business, tech, growth, and product chatter. I'm your host, Lea, and it's time to spill the tea. Welcome to the Product Tea with Lea and Adam Fishman, ex-mountain climber, not capable of shaving for a podcast, and still one of my most revered friends from the San Francisco area. Adam, it is so nice to have you. How are you doing today? I'm great. It's great to be here. Yes, I didn't shave for this event. But the whole point of this is raw conversation, unshaven conversation. Oh, we're going we're gonna to have a lot of that. So my first question to you is, I, I occasionally send you some information about San Francisco and how criminal it is over WhatsApp. So the first question to you is, did someone steal your razors? Is that why you did not shave? Or is that just like your look for today? Just my look. It is pure laziness. Okay. It's a Monday. For me, it's a Monday morning. Just ship my kids off to school. There's no time. There's just no time. Yeah, there's, no there's never a time. I got to record this podcast. I, you know, I couldn't be late. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm paying you good money for it. Right. So how are you going to spend these $30 on? <laughs> my $15 Amazon gift card that you sent me? I'm going to spend it. Uh, it's already spent. It's already yeah, spent. Yeah, I know. I redeemed it before I sent it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I bought some rubber gloves. Yeah. Okay, so let's go with the normal flow here. To the fools that do not know you, can you introduce yourself in a couple of sentences? Sure. Well, a couple, I don't know, but I'll do my best. Go for it. So I'm Adam, Adam Fishman. I have done a bunch of things, been a head of product and growth for many different companies, Lyft, Patreon, Imperfect Foods, currently the interim chief product and technology officer at a marketplace company called Resort Pass. And I teach at Reforge. So I most recently taught the growth series and I co-created the growth leadership program with its 70 plus NPS, might I add. And we're going to get into that later. Co-created it with my pal and your pal, Elena Verna, and do some advising. Got a couple kids, write about how much I hate Jira. I have a newsletter. That's a thing that I do. So I, I do a lot of different things. That's pretty do amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it also explains why we are talking because this is not based on sympathy. This is just like riding each other's coattails. <laughs> That's trying. right. Yeah. So I, I'm pretending to be successful. You're pretending to be successful. We just try to will it now into reality. And truth, we actually don't have a job. We're both living <laughs> under the bridge in <laughs> local countries. Okay, cool. But at so, least you, you live in like a social, there's a socialized healthcare system, right? Don't you have some, some of that? We don't have to get into politics, but in the States, they just leave you out on the street. That's what they do. Yeah. I mean, if so. the streets were at least clean, I mean, that, that would help. But okay. So now everybody switched off already. Thank you very much for that. Sorry. So let's just briefly talk about something that I need to mention right now. So I need to apologize to the community because whenever I talk about NPS, I said some really awful things over the course of the last couple of months. So I need to apologize to everyone who believes in the NPS. And I want to say publicly that it's an absolute utter garbage metric, and I'm going to stand by it. And we're going to talk about it today, among other metrics and other stuff that actually misleads you and gets you into the shitter. Maybe really quick, you posted an article about how much you love Jira. Can you tell us a couple of things about this? Like, why do you love Jira so much, Adam? And why should every company just dump everything in their financial plans, idea backlog, everything? Financial plans, public statements, 10Ks, the whole deal. Yeah, Jira is a tire fire of a product. We all know this, but it also holds us hostage. Talk to 10 companies and nine of the people will be like, I hate Jira and we use it every day. And it's kind of like, why? Why? Why do we have Stockholm Syndrome with Jira where we love our kidnapper and follow it everywhere? The UX is terrible. There's more icons that don't mean anything. Like I can't figure out what to click on. It doesn't auto save things. Confluence. Somebody in my newsletter said we're just gonna shoot Confluence right into the sun, which I think is a good idea. Just fire it to the sun. You have to remember to publish in Confluence. Like who who hits the publish button these days? Like just save and publish it. It's an internal wiki. You don't have to publish it. It's not a web page. It's not like going to customers. Yeah, it's just the reporting is garbage. Burn down metrics. Just so many fields that you don't use. I can't even get started. 
nobody else outside of engineering wants to log into it. You can't do discovery in it. You can't track. It's a colossal pile of crap. That's amazing. Not a fan. Did I tell you that I uh, just closed Atlassian as a consulting contract? <laughs> Good. I, are they advertised? They're at the advertiser on this podcast. Yeah, and they just canceled me. In my article, I almost put at the end that this article was sponsored by Atlassian. But then I decided not to do that because they, they would. Yeah. Happen. So before we burn any bridges to Atlassian, just in case you want to pay us a lot of money, you can approach either of us. That's fine. So I have a couple of funny stories when it comes to Jira, because when you said that it doesn't auto save anything, there's these really funny things. So I'm a very forgetful person. You know, like I have 20 tabs open and I work on 21 of them at the same time. Yeah. So usually what happens is, if you're sitting in the same room with your team and you're starting to write a ticket or like some bullshit stuff that you just have to put in there, you forget to save it. And then you leave your laptop on your desk because God forbid, we just don't take the laptop with us. Then you go into another meeting and you say, well, hey, so what about ticket 671, which always has a very high number because we're very important people. They're looking into it and they're like, yeah, but Leah, did you not fill it in? And I'm like, yeah, I did. And they're like, yeah, but it's not here. And I'm like, oh, I should. I, I must have forgotten to save it. So then you go back to the desk again and then you just save it. There's yeah. just one equal product that I hate as much as Jira in that sense. And that is emails. Emails are in the same league of garbage because you cannot recall them. You cannot edit them in any way once you send them. They just don't make any sense to me. They just give me anxiety. And Jira does as well. In Jira's defense, there's just no better solution for a lot of the things that we have. So I would say 90% of all my consulting clients are using Jira. Of so course. I just wanted to say that. Yeah. yeah, that's the point that I made in the article. Everyone uses it and everyone hates it. And we're all being held hostage. But, you know, there's nothing that's better. There's a lot of things that are like attempting to be better, but they all have problems. I use Notion. I like Notion for some things. I hate it for other things it becomes like the it's like grandma's attic of documents <laughs> like it's just what? it's just you never know what you're going to find up there you're going to go into notion and maybe you're going to find some old coins or like you know a high school diploma or like a trophy or something like i i don't know it's just all over the place i don't like it and the editing interface don't even Get me started on what it's like to try to like write something that's longer than a paragraph in Notion. Not a fan. So wait, wait, wait. So what are we hating on right now? Jira or Notion? Everything. So this is, okay. No, so this we're, is we're why gonna... people are still using Jira. Yeah. Because they hate it, but like there's nothing that's that much better or different. Yeah. Some people have said linear is pretty good. I haven't tried linear. I don't know. They say I don't it's know, very but like yeah, but if they reach out to us and then hire us for a lot of money again, then we're gonna probably like the, it more. This podcast brought to you by Linear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the end of it is sponsored by Atlassian. So the topic for today in general is bullshit metrics. How would you define a bullshit metric without saying one specific one? Like, just give me some guidance on what you think is a bullshit metric. Because I have a, I have a relatively clear frame of mind on why I hate on very specific things. And people yeah. who follow me know that I have a strong opinion on pretty much anything. Yeah, I have a couple of takes on um, bullshit and what defines a bullshit metric. So one is it is hard to do work that actually makes a meaningful impact on that metric. That's one aspect. Number two is when you do impact the metric, it has no bearing on the success of your business or the success of your customer. That's sort of number two. And if there's a third one on what makes a bullshit metric, mm, nope, I'm going to just stick with the two. No, all right, good. Let me just turn it around. You? So what I would say is that let's turn it around. So what is a good, what is a good metric? And I think it's pretty much in what you said. First of all, it needs to be actionable, right? Anything that you measure that doesn't do anything like by itself, it's kind of, it's kind of not really useful. And we're going to get into this why in a second even though it seems to be obvious, but so many people just love stuff that just is not actionable. Another thing that I love saying, because I'm having a very strong qualitative background from qualitative interviewing, is just that everything that is trying to capture something that is hypothetical is usually also a very bad idea. Yeah? So like how likely you would recommend the specific product, for instance, or service is a hypothetical question. So you're not really yeah. getting the answer to this question. That's the second one. And then the third one is, it needs to be comparable in some way to another metric because 
anything without context is useless. So let's just let's just go with that. So let's go with my favorite topic. So when I when I get up in the morning, so I have a cup that says NPS. Is it broken? No, that's is it what missing I, a handle? No, this is usually where the cats go into the litter box. So please remind me again. So you said that you had a really good NPS on your last cohort. Yes. How much 70 was it? Plus, 70 plus NPS with okay. Elena on our growth leadership program. The best <laughs> of all of the Reforge programs this fall. Congratulations. A spring. We're in the spring. Sorry. <laughs> what would you have changed if the rating was 45? That's a good question. <laughs> Probably nothing. <laughs> I'm going to rescue you. Okay. Save so, me. Yeah. So, so the NPS, this is one of the very, very, very few instances where it actually is useful because courses you can actually evaluate in this regard. But if you talk about a SaaS business that has usually just one product, it's not comparable to anything else. So what you can actually right. do is you can take your NPS and tell Casey that it was better than his cohort to rub it into his face. Not that you would do that, yeah. right? So Casey, Never. if you want to come on this, Casey, if you want to come on to this podcast, this is your invitation. But this is what I mean. Like, so as soon as it is kind of comparable, then you can do something with it. So because because of the relation, you kind of know something. Yeah. So yeah, that's the only case where I can think of that the NPS is actually useful. Yeah. So I'll give you a really good example of why most of the time NPS doesn't matter. When I was at Patreon, we worked very, very hard to improve our NPS. And we did this for a while when I first got there and we shipped a bunch of stuff and NPS seemed like it went up. I don't know. It was in like the mid fifties or sixties or something like that. Nothing happened to the business. It didn't grow faster. It didn't grow slower. And then like month to month, NPS would kind of go like this, even if nothing changed. And so to me, that's like not very reliable because I, if it's sort of just based on your whim and how you feel when you wake up in the morning, that doesn't seem like a very good metric to me. How many users uh, did you have? A lot of users, but we only surveyed people above a certain size. We no. tracked the NPS of a certain cohort of people. And that was fine. But again, it didn't end up mattering. Even when it got better, it didn't matter. No. And then it got worse and we didn't change anything. And so it was like what are we doing here? Maybe we shouldn't pay attention to this anymore. Yeah, fair enough. So I wrote a couple of articles on this topic, right? So because I kind of refined my hate on NPS. So I want to stay on this for one second, because what I did is the first version of my hate for NPS came from a very practical standpoint. And the standpoint is, at that time, I was spending over 20 years in tech and I've never seen it do anything good for me. Okay, right? So like that was kind of the first basis of it all. Then I started to refine it. I found some reasons that actually supported my hypothesis and that made me sound really smart. But if you had to condense it like to three points, and this goes a little bit also into why other metrics are bad, is first of all, just as a repetition, what does the NPS ask? It asks, how likely would you recommend this product to someone else? It's a hypothetical question again. But mm -hmm. you can absolutely love a product, but hate an individual feature. So even if somebody gives you a really good rating, you still don't know what they don't like, which is an extremely important data point to reduce churn. Now people will tell you, yeah, well, okay, but you still know like whether someone really hates your product. Well, that is true. But unfortunately, if you take the same data set of 100,000 people and you query them again after a year on the NPS again, the people who hated you are not in there anymore. So the right. NPS is a self-correcting metric in the sense that those that really hate you, they just tell you and then they fuck off. Right. They're not here anymore. So right. your sample size just actually started to clean yourself. And then you think, oh my God, look at us. We actually improved our product. And then the third reason, and this is my favorite one, because I've been in so many calls with very highly paid people. And I've been guilty of this, where we just throw each other the NPS, like, oh, did you see it? We have in quarterly reports. We have an NPS of 74 and Apple had 64, something like this. The problem is exactly what you just said. If it's not standardized in any way, because there's nothing in the definition of an NPS, when you should ask it, who you should ask, because you cannot prompt everyone. So what we did at SmallPDF is we let you use the product five times. 
relatively specific, right? So like the same function after five times, what do you think is going to happen? People who use the product five times are more likely to give it a more positive rating than those that only sure. use it once or twice. So yeah. how do you balance this? It's total bullshit. My favorite was reading the verbatims on NPS and people would say, they give you like a three or like a two. And then the ver verbatim would be, I love the product, but I just don't know anyone that I could tell about it. And it was <laughs> yeah. like, well, that's not helpful. Two. I'm like, but you love the product. You just don't have anyone that you would promote it to. You don't know anyone who could use it. Okay. Well, I guess we're bad. Terrible. Ver no. The verbatims. Not I don't fan. know. You know, I think that's one problem of it. So like, you can misunderstand it. And then you have people who write also into the NPS rating that you're a total asshole and they give you a 10 rating. I mean, what are you going <laughs> to do with that? So I had people in my comments who told me, well, Leah, you know, like, but the qualitative part of the NPS is really, really valuable. Well, turns out that is actually not a part of the NPS. You can do this with other metrics as well. So what I would sure. suggest to use very specifically is CSET. The worst offender, by far and worst, the worst offender attribute of an NPS is, is that it suggests you that it gives you a picture of something. Somebody dared to tell me in a very lengthy post that they actually posted after me and then they tagged me and then they said that I was a witch or something. They told me that the NPS is the number one tool to see whether you have product market fit. Again, if you think about it, if everybody off boards themselves, you will always have product market fit with NPS at some point, as long as you just retain the good, kind of good users in that sense. So it yep. doesn't mean anything in that regard. Don't like it. No. Okay. I think we killed the NPS. I hope it's uh, dead. It's dead. Okay, good. Next. So what would you suggest to use instead of NPS? I mean, I said CSAT. Would you agree with this? Do you have another one that you find C really good? CSAT's good. At Patreon, we built a custom metric, actually. We did this sort of trust score metric. Mm -hmm. because we realized that creators would leave the platform if they felt like the platform was untrustworthy. And a lot of creative types get jerked around by lots of creator tools platforms, and they want to trust the place that they're putting their energy and effort, especially if it's a paycheck for them. So we built a, this trust score metric, and then we track that over time through the same... Yeah cohorts of people. And that was really interesting because we also were able to ask them about other products as well and how they would score that. And so we sort of saw how we stood relatively relative to that. And then it also gave us an interesting read on things that we did that would harm trust with our users, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. But I also like CSAT. At some point, I'm going to write a post on this trust metric thing, but it's it's fairly no. nuanced. So I don't remember all the data points that we use, but it was, it was pretty robust. I it remember when we had to... So we also had to find kind of a replacement because I had my inherent hate of NPS already back then, and I was responsible for the core product. So what we did is we tried to apply CES. And CES is, I think, a concept that I actually learned from Reforge. I don't even know whether it exists outside of Reforge. But this is about the customer effort score. Like, how easy was this for you? And yep. the good thing is, is you use this at a success point after a feature has been used to see, like, hey, Adam, how much did you like this, right? So, like, a very good example is as if I'm always using the Tesla example. I'm sitting in my Tesla. I'm using my wind wipers. And at the moment where I use the wind wipers and I'm done with it, they ask, like, how do you like it? Because it is possible that I give a positive NPS rating of my Tesla overall, but I hate the wind wipers. There's not a lot mm -hmm. to love with the wind wipers. And the good thing about this is you usually ask in the dimension of like one to five. You can have one feature that has an average CES score of 2.5 and the other one as well. But if you start to split it up and you look at the distribution, you usually have completely different patterns. So it is possible that everybody either hates or loves it, or mm -hmm. you have the typical middle finger, which I'm not going to show now into the camera. I guess you can imagine how that looks like. So everybody's indifferent to it. And usually opportunity lives where you have extreme scores. What differentiates the cord of those that give it a one rating and what differentiates those that give it a five rating? I would say I had some really interesting indicators for finding ICP profiles with this because these are usually completely different user types. So people who strive for efficiency, they don't like the depth of features and so forth. And then you kind of get away from this entire discussion of, 
oh, we should not duplicate features. Yeah, maybe you have to because in a specific flow, it's necessary for these users and so forth. But this is where I am. Who do you think gives the Tesla wind- windshield wipers a, a five? Are you a one or a five on that? I'm a, I'm a one, definitely. Yeah, no, I, I hate them. I'm, I yeah. hate them. And I think everybody does. Yeah. And I don't think terrible. even Tesla likes them. It's just something <laughs> to annoy you around. No, but this is quite interesting, right? It is, it is very important because the way that you will, the features that you list on your feature page or, or pricing page or in your sales pitch are usually not the features that make people churn. Right. The most silly things make you churn from products. My phone does not connect with the radio. Like this is a 40, 50,000 grand car, 40, 40, 50 grand car, right? Yeah. So you would say like, oh, that's silly. But, you know, in the end, this is exactly the kind of stuff that makes you leave the car. Not the wind wipers. Yep. I mean, it depends. Unless you drive the car in a pool. <laughs> Don't know why you would do that, but yeah, there you go. All right. So <clears throat> let me just pivot here for one second. That there's sure. a there's a there's a question from a from an avid podcast listener. Her name is Elena 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 Vier, Ver, Verna, and she says that she loves CAC. Do you have an opinion on this in any way? Well, I think first let's define CAC, customer yeah. acquisition cost. Amazing. How much you spend to acquire, as in get somebody to use and pay for your product, what you spend, the company, right? That's the, did I get that right? That's the definition? I think, I don't know. Like, so I'm not Elena, so I don't okay. know what, to, I don't know what she meant, but. Clearly Elena loves customer acquisition cost. Actually, no, customer acquisition cost is, a lot of people do this, the calculate this sort of CAC LTV ratio. And LTV is the lifetime value of a customer to you, the business. And there, for a long time, was this sort of like magical, well, if you earn three times the value of what you spend, so a three to one LTV to CAC ratio is really good. The problem with that and with CAC is what if it takes you 10 years to recoup that cost? If your LTV CAC is three to one, but the value of the customer doesn't come, I don't know, years down the road, that's not very helpful for you as a business, especially if you're trying to run a healthy business and reinvest proceeds. And so the metric that I like much better than looking at CAC is looking at payback period. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, in the earlier stages of a business, and actually all stages of a business, what you really want to know is when can I reinvest these proceeds and to, to grow further? And so that's why payback period matters. Because with two, let's say we have two LTV CAC ratios that are identical, but one pays itself back in a month and the other pays itself back in two years. I want to go for the business that pays itself back in a month because I can grow faster, because I can reinvest much faster. And so that's why CAC is sort of useless-ish. Yeah. Bum that Elena loves it so much. Yeah, I don't know what it is with her. Okay, I think we need to clarify something in case someone actually starts to Google her. So <laughs> she actually launched a boycott on the CAC four days ago when this yes. episode was recorded. And it was, I think, the most performing post that either her or me ever did. It, it, it went past individual contributor roles. I think she had about 5,000 reactions on it, which is massive. And yes, the argument was kind of the same. I think there's two things to this. Like when we're talking about CAC, it's one of those metrics that doesn't make sense without context itself. So yeah. this three to one ratio rule is a very interesting one. It actually also is interesting in terms of like, if you're in a sales-led company like the one that I am right now, so with Jua, we're selling two enterprise contracts. There's still some value in it to figure out, okay, what is the kind of impact that I'm generating with the customer? And if I think that I can generate at least five times the impact that they can see immediately, then they're going to pay me 20% of that value back in kind of my sales leverage. But that has nothing to do with CAC. It's just like these kind of rough numbers, they do make sense. They do definitely make sense for certain negotiations. But as you said, the longer the payback period is, the more risky it is also 
to lose this contract prematurely due to market movements, due to other things. The cost to serve is usually also starting to get flaky. It can be that for some reason, your cost to serve goes actually up with time. You're just introducing a lot of unnecessary risk into the business because you're not really looking at how fast that you can recoup it. There's nothing against making back something over five years, but not an investment. It's okay if we can have customers over five years, if they only cost us $10 to acquire and I have the acquisition cost fast. That's what we want to do. We're not against long-term lifetime value in any sense. But I think that is one of the very common mistakes that I also seen from startups that they go into funding rounds, for instance, and then they talk about CAC and all the revenue that they have booked. And then you see on the balance sheet, look, you have 90% of your revenue is booked, so it's not realized yet. And this is coming back in the next four years. So you're talking to me like, we're just going to wait for four years until this stuff, until this traction actually comes back. And then they hope that they get a good valuation from it. So there's a fundamental difference with, between booked revenue and realized revenue. Until the time has not passed and you don't have the money in your bank, it's not realized. Yep. And also in the earlier stages of a business, it's really hard to predict the value, the long-term value of a, of a customer. Like you don't have a lot of data. So you either have to get, you have to sort of fudge a, a terminal endpoint, right? Where you say, well, well, they'll just retain indefinitely after 12 months. But that is probably not true, right? Unless you're talking about, you know, Jira customers. So that's really hard is how do you actually calculate the lifetime value of a customer that you haven't had them for a lifetime? Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, like if we look at the valuation of a, of a business itself, what we do is we do a discounted cash flow analysis. We're trying to say like, okay, the hundred dollars that I have today are more worth than a hundred dollars that I have next year. And this kind of, I'm not sure whether that's what you meant, but like after five years, you usually attribute a value that's called the terminal value, which is significantly lower than the first year value. And right. I usually don't see this also in the valuation of LTV. So like if you're telling me like, well, you know, like over the next five years, we're going to make this much, this, this amount of money. Well, did you adjust this? Because there is a risk of you losing it. Even if yep. you have a five-year contract signed, there is a risk that specific businesses are going out of fashion, no matter what the terms are that you have. So there's always an introduced risk. So, yep. so now we kill the NPS and CAC. Very good. I think Dead. that was a good performance so far. Dead. Yeah. Dead on Pretty arrival. Dead. Sorry, yeah. Elena, we killed your metric. <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough. Let's maybe, so one of the other ones that I actually forgot to talk about when we're talking about Jira. And this, so this is not necessarily when we're coming from Jira. This is just about team efficiency. Yeah. So how efficient is your team? And I think you mentioned it at the very start. There's a couple of things that really bad managers in my career have tried to manage us or me also in the teams. And there were two of them. First one was burn down points. I think they are the worst introduction ever that you can have to any business. So how do burn down points work? We do estimations of stores. We attribute points to them. And then at the end of the month or at the end of the sprint, we're looking at how many of these points are still left or like how many of them get do, did we get done? And there's usually two things that happen. Two days before the sprint ends, before the points are counted, everything goes up because nothing was finished before. <laughs> and one of the things about metrics is if you do measure them, something happens with them. Some manager is going to grab them and then going to ask, Adam, why did you only get 42 points done? In the last sprint, it was, it was more. What is your problem, Adam? And then what are you going to say? This is just like, this is top level toxic shit. It's just <laughs> not good. This is why I find it so laughable. Like you're trying to evaluate the value that the team delivers through this. There's so many ways on how to manipulate them. The first time you punish your team, what are they going to do? They're going to overestimate everything. They're going to give eight points to every little bug fix. Yep. It's just not helpful. I don't know. Yeah, 100%. That's what I would say. I think the gaming of these metrics of things like burn down is, is the biggest problem with them. And the nature of software development is essentially uncertain, right? Like you get into something and it ends up being harder or you get pulled into something else and there's untracked work that's happening and then it takes you longer to get to the other thing. And like, that's just part of working in a company. 
And so to punish people for that, I guess you have a couple of things. One, they're going to overestimate, like you, like you said. Yeah, or the other thing is they're going to say, no, I can't do this other thing because I've got to burn down my points. And that other thing might be no. something that's really important that saves a customer or like wins a new customer or something like that. No, you obviously want focus, but not at the expense of rationality, right? So what would you ask or like what would you answer if one of your consulting clients says like, Adam, our teams are not performing. How should we measure their performance? What would your answer be? I usually say, how do you know they're not performing? What are they delivering? And what is the impact that that's having on the business? And how's your business doing? If a lot of times it's just this sense, the founder or the CEO has this like restlessness. They just assume, you know, that things aren't happening. But if the metrics are moving, if the team is getting things done, I don't know, hard to brand them that they're not necessarily performing. Could they perform faster? Probably. Could they do that over a sustained period of time? I don't know. Maybe not. So yeah, that's usually what I ask first is like, how do you know? And what do you find? Do you find that every CEO has perfect visibility and their goals were set perfect and it's just always the developer's fault? Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I find every time. Blame the developers. 110% of the time, it's the lazy, lazy software developers that just aren't whacking away in the keys fast enough. Thank you very much. The, this was the last the episode things. of the product seek. <laughs> <laughs> people are going to egg your house. No, of course not. It's usually people are working as hard as they can. Maybe they're not working on the right stuff. That's not a them problem. That's a you problem. That's a product no. manager problem or a CEO problem. Not a you're not moving fast enough problem. Or you haven't gotten the requisite buy-in to get people excited about it. So yeah, it's very rarely the lazy software engineer. No. So yeah. I have a theory about this. And I uh -oh. think it goes a bit further. No, no, it's nothing spicy. But like it's, it's kind of interesting, I think. Why are we doing this in the first place? Why are we trying to control people by... Well, it's not really controlling. But let's just say like, you know, maybe the intent is not that bad. You want to measure what your team does. Okay, fair enough. Sure. So why do you resort to trying to measure the amount of code that has been produced? Because that's essentially what it is. Even if you do not count the lines of code, which is also a fun measure, by the way, Elon. So you have to print it so, out, though. Sorry? To print it out and, and review it. Yeah, on, good on job paper. for him. How's Twitter yeah. doing? Okay, so let's not go into this. Maybe I'm going to no. consult for them. So I have a theory on why this happens. And I think it is because these managers typically just do not know usually how to do it any different. I'm not saying it is easy to measure a team's success because this is quite hard. When I do OKR planning, and I, I love OKR planning just like you love annual roadmaps. Love them. Especially with dates. So if you sit down and you say like, okay, for the next quarter, what does a team have to achieve to make me unequivocally happy? So that if they would achieve it after a week and then they go to holidays, that is a good goal. Where I would say, if you can get this kind of thing done and I'm happy, because but that's not a delivery. That's not just like some feature that is in some way connected to customer success. So you need to be also to be able to measure this. What does that mean? You need to be sure about your ICPs and so forth. This is hard to do. But if you cannot do this, and a lot of managers cannot do that, then what do they do? They resort to these kind of measures. And then the other ultra old measure that we use to evaluate people's performance is attendance time. Yep. Adam, Punch in the clock. You came 15 minutes late today. When are you going to compensate that? Yep. And that's what happened to me all the time. And then you get to get an idea, well, in order to be a good performing person, I have to work more. I have to leave after my boss does and all that kind of stuff. And I went into this red wheel myself. So this is why I think this is happening. And then it becomes kind of performative. First of all, I mean, I think it's all a relic of assembly line culture, right? Like you put the widget on the assembly line. How many widgets do we get through in an hour? Could we do 10% more widgets? And that's sort of what it, what it's a, uh, it's a relic of. And the reality is like, I think like you mentioned, it's not, I, I love to say, the phrase that most people's grandparents have said, which is don't equate motion 
for progress. There's a big difference between moving on a lot of things, which is easy to see. I can see that people are moving on work. I can see that the assembly line has been sped up by 10%. Okay, we're moving. That's motion. Cool. A lot of people feel good about motion. The problem is, is you can flail away at the wrong stuff all day long. And that's not progress. So you can have a bunch of widgets that go out the door. And then turns out nobody wants to buy that number of widgets. Or the widgets have a defect. Or, you know, something else. And so what you really care about is progress. Right? You care about, are we getting enough of the right things done so that our business is growing, our metrics are no. moving, and not just is the team efficient. Team can be super efficient and ship yeah. the wrong stuff all day yeah. long. Yeah, You don't win with a super efficient team. In fact, I would argue that a lot of the best teams are probably not that efficient. So anyway, that's my take. Assembly line. I'm totally with you. And I think, let me go on a one minute tangent and then I try to keep it short. So like the way that machine learning works, because this is very, very relevant to this is also quite interesting. So the way that we tried to communicate with computer programs traditionally so far as we gave it instructions to do something and then we hope that it would produce the correct outcome. So let's say I have a program that tells you, make me a cake that looks like Adam. Then I'm going to get the ingredients. Yeah, I know you're not. Right. Why would you okay. ever eat that cake? So you got to get the ingredients and then also the baking instructions. And then you hope what it comes out looks like Adam, the fruit cake. So it's red. It's, it's red. Exactly. What's now happening with machine learning is we do not give instructions at all anymore. We only say as long as the output is good and you have what you need to do, we accept that we do not know what's happening in the middle. That's literally what happens. And yep. there is a good metaphor for this in the sense of like how you make an arc now to team building as well. This is also how I manage my teams. The best way for me to let go and not care what happens in between is if you deliver results that I have intelligently said before, as I said before, in terms of, you know, what goals do you need to reach so I am happy at the end of the next three months? Yep. And this is fundamentally kind of the same. Do you care what happens in between? No, you don't, as long as the outcomes are correct. So spend a lot of time to figure out what a measurable output is and an outcome that you want to have, and then yeah. you work back, but not the other way around. And that's why I'm saying like there's no correlation between, well, there is some correlation. I mean, if you don't come to work at all, you don't have a chance to actually achieve something. But it is not as crazy as people think. Yeah, it's sort of this intersection of autonomy and accountability, no. right? Like you can have, you can do... And operate however it is that you want to that you want to operate full autonomy, but and you have to deliver the and be accountable to that output, no. that metric that we care about, that success, and those two things work together, right, in concert. No, okay, cool. I think we have to close it soon because you have oh, to no. go and bake a cake. No, no, no that's fine. So let's just I have make to a very make a machine learning cake. Yeah, very good. So let's do a quick fire crap round on metrics. Okay. So I'm yeah. going to tell you a metric and you tell me what you think of it. Like the first thing that comes to your mind. It doesn't have to make sense. Okay. Yep. MQLs. Don't like. Very good. Correct. That was the end of the lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think we have to do this again. I think we have to just hate on things. Let me ask you one. Yeah, go I'm for it. Ask I you have one. Time. This one's going to be very near and dear to your heart. I have time. Followers. Totally the best thing in life. You have and a lot of them. Yeah, well, that's true. That's because I am posting quality content. If I had not a lot of them, I would not like them. Yeah. It's Let me tell what you is. what matters even more than followers. Tell me. And that is engagements. Because you can have a million followers. And if every time you shit something out on LinkedIn, crickets, yeah. no thumbs up, no comments, nothing. Well, I don't think those million people like you very much. I don't even that know is, why they're following you. That is correct. More but, important is the thumbs up, the commentary, the resharing, the love, right? That's the engagement. That's what matters more than the raw number of followers. But you know, followers is the first thing that we see right? When we like open up a dashboard, it's like yeah. always there. 
it strokes the ego. But it's I not have, really that. It doesn't really matter that much. I have more engagements than some people that have 7 million followers. I believe um, it. No, I really do. Like, and Elena has even more than me. And that gives me a lot of other problems. I don't know whether we should keep this in the episode, but we'll see. But yeah, no. But like we're having good engagement metrics because we actually post quality content and the rest doesn't, right? Like we're, we're totally not vain or anything. Um, totally not vain. No, we don't like the attention. Adam, how should people get in contact with you? And uh, should we repeat this again? We should repeat this again. I would love to opine on more metric hot takes with you. People can get in touch with me via my newsletter, Fishman, my last name, F-I-S-H-M-A-N. AF newsletter.com. Just published something recently on Jira. Have some other things in the hopper. Excited to start writing more now that I only have one job. So yeah, that's coming. Check it out. That sounds amazing. Thank you very much for being on this episode. And I'm going to close with a philosophical saying, teach a fish to man, and he's going to be a man for the rest of his life. <laughs> Adam, it was a pleasure. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to The Product Tea with Leah. If you don't have enough yet, you can subscribe to my podcast right now at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can head to my website, leahtarin.com, which is L-E-A-H-T-H-A-R-I-N.com, where you can find much more of my material or just want to work with me. 